So digestive system, we are going to start with an overview. So we're going to kind of just go over like what organs are actually part of the digestive system, how we categorize them, of course. Um, we're going to look at the basic anatomy of the whole system, um, as well as the basic functions. And then we're going to work our way through um, the whole system, uh, basically following the path that things that we eat would take. Because I think that makes the most sense. And it would be really weird to do it another way. So first of all, major functions of the digestive system are to break down the foods that we eat and get them into our body. So releasing and absorbing nutrients for use by the body. Um, the goal for most of it, as we'll see later, is to get it into the blood. Um, and, um, you know, as long as the food and, you know, water too, technically, whatever liquids you consume, but we're just going to say food, as long as it's in the lumen, so the, the insides of these hollow organs of the digestive system, it's not technically inside of your body. Um, technically, it's just kind of in a space contained by your body and until it gets absorbed through these tissue layers it's not inside. Um, I don't know if I'll remember to emphasize that later but I, I find that to be a, a relevant point. So when we look at the digestive system we see that it's made up of two basic parts. So there's the gastrointestinal tract or as your textbook likes to say the alimentary tract means the same thing. And it's literally a tube running through our body, starting at the mouth, ending with the anus. It's a continuous tube. And while sure there's lots of twists and turns, it's still this completely continuous thing. Now that's not the whole digestive system though. The digestive system also includes accessory organs. So accessory organs are everything that's part of the system that isn't part of the tube. And mostly that stuff in your mouth, as well as your liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. So um, this is the whole thing. Um, everything that's part of the tube is listed up here, starting with your mouth. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about what a pharynx is in a little bit. Esophagus, stomach, and then we've got a whole bunch of intestines that, as we'll talk about next week, um, we divide up into small and large, and then it ends with your rectum and your anus. Your accessory organs are everything aiding in the process that aren't part of the tube. So about half of them are in your mouth because your teeth, your tongue, and your salivary glands actually count as accessory organs. And then in your abdomen, it's going to be your liver, gallbladder, and your pancreas. Okay? Oh, no. All right, now when we look at the microscopic anatomy of the tube, so just the gastrointestinal tract, we see that the whole thing is made up of the same four tissue layers. Now there's of course differences between them because they've been modified to fit the function of each part, but they all have four layers. So um, we'll work through them one at a time, but this is from the outside in. So serosa um, is the outer layer. Then there's a layer of smooth muscle that we call the muscularis. Uh, there's a submucosa, which is a connective tissue that underlies the mucosa, which is the epithelial tissue. So remember, epithelial tissue always um, lines, uh, you know, the, the, the outer layers are lumens of things, so the mucosa faces into the hollow part of this hollow tube. That's what's in contact with the middle. So it basically looks like this, and we'll work through each of these layers as we go and, and kind of explain all these various words that are on this diagram. So this is our overview diagram of the whole thing. So we'll be starting actually on the inside with the mucosa. So um, you may or may not remember when we talked about connective tissues uh, and we, we briefly talked about membranes. 
So membranes are typically the, um, the tissue layers that line and cover everything in the body, right? So like your skin is the cutaneous membrane um, and mucous membranes are what line all of the systems that have um, exposure to the external environment. And that includes your digestive system um, as well as like your respiratory system and a couple of others. So technically speaking, the epithelium and underlying connective tissue of the entire gastrointestinal tract is called a mucous membrane. Um, but we typically refer to, refer to it as a mucosa. And the reason why both of those things are what we call it is because there's going to be mucus involved. We're gonna have mucus producing cells. It's going to provide lubrication for various um, functions. And one of the things providing that mucus is going to be those goblet cells that we learned about before. The exact type of epithelium varies by location. So the beginning of the tract, including your mouth, is gonna be non-keratinized, stratified, squamous epithelium. Um, a lot of the rest of the tract is going to be simple columnar with microvilli for absorption. And so we'll kind of touch on each epithelium as we get to different parts of the system. Um, there is typically goblet cells present and or other uh, mucus producing glands. And um, we often also find uh, these cells called enteroendocrine cells. So they're individualized cells that make hormones relevant to the, the digestive system. We'll talk about a few of those hormones as we go through, although not a lot of them. Um, we'll be leaving a lot of it out because it's too much information for the time that we have. Um, just realize that everything we talk about is gonna be more complicated than we're actually touching on. So they're called enteroendocrine because endocrine refers to hormone producing cells and organs and entero refers to uh, the intestines basically. So that's just describing what it does. Now, every epithelium is going to be supported by a connective tissue layer and in the gastrointestinal tract, we call that layer the lamina propria or proper layer. So this is typically loose connective tissue, so almost certainly areolar. Um, it of course anchors the epithelium and provides a pathway for the blood vessels that support it, as well as lymphatic vessels um, and lymphatic tissues, and some amount of um, nerve endings will be in there as well. Uh, we haven't talked about lymphatic tissue, but basically, um, it's part of the immune system. So this is mucosa associated lymphatic tissue, which you don't really need to know, but just explaining it. Um, and lymphatic vessels are similar to blood vessels, but a little bit different. And we'll talk about them more when we get to the small intestine, because that's when they're gonna be particularly relevant. The last layer of the mucosa is a layer of smooth muscle. So we call it the muscularis mucosa, literally the muscle of the, of the mucous membrane. Um, and basically it increases the surface area of the epithelium by folding it. And we'll look at some of the types of folds as we see different parts of the, um, the tract uh, because they have different names and stuff. But their basic function is just to increase the surface area so that more epithelium is able to contact more of the ingesta, the, the food and liquids that we have consumed, and then they get mixed with secretions from our own tract. So then just deep to that is the submucosa. Um, the submucosa is uh, the dense layer of connective tissue um, underneath the mucosa. So this is gonna provide a strong connection between the mucosa and the muscularis layer, which is deeper than that. This is the pathway for larger blood vessels and lymphatic vessels. So you can think about this as being very similar to the hypodermis um, and the deeper part of the dermis in the skin. So, you know, the skin has the epidermis and then it's supported by the, um, by the papillary layer of the dermis and that's like you know the epithelium here and the um the lamina propria and so then this is like the reticular layer of the dermis and the and the hypodermis 
having that denser connective tissue, larger blood vessels. Um, this is also where we have a lot of uh, larger glands that are going to secrete into the lumen, as well as an entire network of nerves that are part of the enteric nervous system. So uh, I mentioned briefly the enteric nervous system in the last system. It's a whole separate um, group of autonomic ganglia and nerves that um, regulate the function of the digestive system. And um, the majority of it is arranged in these two um, nerve complexes, I guess, um, called plexuses. And, and I'll touch on them a little bit more as we go through, but this is where one of them is located. So it's called the submucosal plexus because it's a whole bunch of nerves in the submucosa. So that takes us to the next layer, which is the muscularis. So named because it's several layers of smooth muscle. The majority of the system, there is an inner circular layer. So um, circular because it's uh, the sheets follow the, um, yeah, well, um, around the tube. They go around the tube, sorry. Uh, yeah, so like, this is my pen. It, it's going around like that. And so basically a circular layer, if it's gonna constrict, it's gonna be able to like actually like close the lumen at a certain location. And then there's an outer longitudinal layer that runs the length of the tube. Um, and they both work together to do various things that we'll talk about later. Um, there are some exceptions. So the stomach actually has an additional layer that we'll cover when we get there. And then um, the very ends of the tube, so the mouth, the pharynx and the anus, they have skeletal muscle rather than smooth muscle because those parts are under uh, voluntary control. But the rest of it is a couple layers of smooth muscle. And um, so the functions of that are basically all the mechanical things that our digestive system does. So um, mixes the contents of the lumen and also transports it. So moves it through the entire tract. Um, this is controlled mostly by another uh, organization of nerves called the myenteric plexus. And those two, submucosal and myenteric plexus, make up the majority of the enteric nervous system. So then the outermost layer um, is, is actually, there's a little bit of an exception. So it's not every single part of the, of the tract. So for organs in the abdominal cavity, their outermost layer is called a serosa. And that's because it's actually a layer of the peritoneum. So the serosal membrane that lines everything in the abdomen. And we'll talk about this more in a second. Um, it serves not only to be the outer layer of the tract, but it also suspends all of these organs within the abdomen and keeps them organized. So parts of the digestive system or particularly parts of the um, gastrointestinal tract that are not in the abdominal cavity have a different outermost layer. So we call that layer an adventitia, and it's just some dense connective tissue. So it's literally just a bunch of collagen fibers that keep those organs anchored to their surrounding tissues. So the mouth, the pharynx, and the esophagus, and uh, technically the very ending, of the rectum and the anus, although I never actually list them here, um, they have adventitia rather than serosa. And that just keeps them anchored. This is very similar to what like blood vessels and nerves have um, to keep them attached to whatever tissues they're running through. Um, all right, so here's our overview again. So you can see that um, this whole layer here is our mucosa, including our epithelium, um, our lamina propria, and then our mucosa, our muscularis mucosa. And then our submucosa is here with larger blood vessels running through and the submucosal plexus is these little yellow guys. And then we have several layers of smooth muscle here. So this is circular because it's encircling 
the tube and longitudinal because it's running this way. And then finally, we've got serosa, which um, includes this guy here, the mesentery, which we'll talk about in a second, but is basically the pathway for all these blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatic vessels. So, nerves. The enteric nervous system is actually quite large, so 100 million neurons contained within the gastrointestinal tract. And it's considered semi-autonomic. -aut um, so it's kind of like the third branch of the autonomic nervous system. Um, it does a lot of its own regulation, but there is interaction and input with the central nervous system. Generally speaking, these are all the neurons that are gonna regulate digestive system activity, including secretion and um, action of smooth muscle. So we call them all enteric neurons because they're um, dealing with the intestines, essentially. Uh, as I said, um, most of the enteric nervous system is contained within these two plexuses. So they're literally in the layers of the tube. So the myenteric plexus, and I won't use this, but just so you're aware, this is the older name, Auerbach plexus. Again, named after people that find these things. So this one is in the muscularis layer, the smooth muscle layers, and so it regulates smooth muscle action. And most of the ways that it does that is that it regulates the rhythm with which it contracts, as well as the force with which it contracts. And we'll look at some examples of that as we go through. And then the submucosal plexus is also called Meisner's. Again, not gonna use those, but just so you're aware that those are the older terms. And so this is more dealing with um, glandular stuff. So this is all about digestive secretions from the various glands in different parts of the tract, um, as well as more of an overlap with um, like the various hormones related to the, um, the digestive system um, and includes a lot of um, monitoring of what's in the lumen so that we can have appropriate reactions to foods based on their contents. Um, basically, we're able to know like if something's got a lot of carbohydrates in it or a lot of protein, etc. We'll touch very briefly on that next week. Um, you may remember we talked in the autonomic nervous system about short reflexes versus long reflexes. This is not something we see on the somatic side. This is an autonomic thing where basically sometimes we don't need to go to the central nervous system to um, have that uh, integration function. So when we have entirely um, contained reflexes where they never leave the enteric nervous system, they're short, ref short reflexes. Um, and that's because there are things in here that can regulate, especially the muscular activity. So segmentation and peristalsis are both types of muscular activity um, that are controlled entirely within the uh, muscularis plexus itself. Long reflexes are when we're actually sending that sensory information back up to the central nervous system um, and uh, we're having regulation come down from the central nervous system. Um, a lot of this is parasympathetic, and so it's going to be traveling down by the vagus nerve. Um, but we do have sympathetic innervation in here as well. And usually the sympathetic innervation actually shuts down a lot of these functions because um, our digestive system is not considered to be critical for life-saving, like immediate response stuff. So sympathetic innervation usually suppresses um, what this stuff does. So long reflexes can be initiated either inside or outside of the gastrointestinal tract and um, are going to actually involve um, upper function. Not to say that we're aware of it, because this can be spinal cord, brain stem, probably a lot of hypothalamus, stuff like that. <clears throat> 
okay, so when we're looking at this, um, and we're trying not to get too far into the details of how all of this is regulated, um, we can kind of look at it like this. So as we work our way through these various organs, we're gonna see a theme of how digestive activity is regulated. Um, for the most part, digestive activity is in response to what we're putting into the system. So it's provoked by mechanical and chemical stimuli, and those are gonna be caused by whatever we're consuming. So stretch, for example, distension of various parts of the tract by whatever we're putting in is gonna be a major factor. Um, and then other factors are gonna be things like changes in pH, which we'll see as we go through stomach and small intestine, as well as osmolarity changes. So this is just referring to like how much water is in there compared to ions and other things. Um, so this is gonna be the major thing that regulates how the system is functioning at any given time. Um, and then whenever we need to respond to those things, we're going to be using smooth muscle and um, glands, mostly exocrine glands. And just like every other part of the body, we're gonna find that it's a combination of neuronal and endocrine control for digestive activity. So I know we've talked about the endocrine system um, and we'll talk about it, well, you guys will cover it in your second semester. Um, uh, we're not gonna touch on, as I said, a lot of them, but there are many hormones involved in the regulation of the digestive system. We'll touch on just a couple of really big ones um, and you'll hopefully kind of get a feel for how that works. Um, here's just a different picture of the plexuses. So um, my enteric plexus, so muscles of the intestines, right? Um, running in between the muscular layers and then our submucosal plexus in here. And what this is showing you is that there are ganglia in here as well as various nerves running in there. And that's about as far as we're gonna go for what this does. We'll, we'll bring up some of these reflexes as we get to different parts. Um, it's all very complicated and we still don't even know exactly how all of this works. So um, there's a couple of resources here if you're curious because we're learning more and more about the interaction, especially via the vagus nerve between the enteric nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. Um, and I'll touch on this later, but also between the microbes in your intestines and your brain, it's all very interesting. Um, so here's a couple articles because we don't really have time to get into it in this course, um, but it's certainly um, important and relevant. Uh, last couple things on the overview. So blood supply. Um, if we had covered the cardiovascular system already, then I would get into this more, but because we haven't, um, not going to worry about it too much, except as to where it's completely relevant. So basically, um, you know, when we think about the blood supply to most places in the body, we're just thinking about supplying those tissues with oxygen and nutrients and then taking away their waste products. But when we look at the digestive system, that blood supply is also absorbing nutrients that are being digested. Uh, so when we get to um, the metabolism of this stuff in a week, um, we'll talk more about the blood supply from the intestines to the liver um, and how um, the liver handles uh, the processing of everything that we absorb um, before the rest of the body gets to it. So that's kind of a big difference here um, between things like the muscles and even the nervous system um, having a blood supply versus the digestive system. So we're not gonna worry about particular blood vessels or anything like that, because like I said, we haven't covered that system, um, but we'll, we're gonna touch on the uh, fine details when we get to the liver. So the last concept that we wanna tackle is explaining all this peritoneum stuff a little bit more, because um, I briefly mentioned it, and um, when we were covering tissues, but we didn't really get into it, and it's a relatively complicated membrane, but it's um, somewhat important to um, the anatomical layout of the digestive system. 
So the peritoneum is one of several serous membranes that we have. It's the one that lines the entire abdominal cavity. So we have others, but they're in the thoracic cavity around the lungs and around the heart. Uh, serous membranes mean that the, the epithelium is a simple squamous epithelium um, with a thin layer of usually areolar connective tissue. And um, it secretes serous fluid, which is just a little bit of basically filtered fluid from the blood. And that fluid aims to um, decrease friction. So the reason why we have this is because um, all of the uh, internal organs in these ventral cavities, so your lungs, your heart, and all of these intestines, they move. And we don't want them to be rubbing against each other in a way that's gonna cause problems. And so the serous membrane eliminates the friction of the outer parts of these organs rubbing against each other. In order to do that, we need the abdominal cavity itself to be lined, and we need the outer part of the abdominal organs to be lined so that we're having these very low friction um, surfaces interacting with each other. So the part of the peritoneum that lines the abdominal cavity is called the parietal peritoneum. And this is, um, parietal just means wall. I had to look that up at some point um, because it's literally the walls of the cavity. So this is the insides of your muscles, basically. And then the organs are lined with what we call the visceral peritoneum because, of course, the visceral refers to um, internal organs. So it looks kind of like this. It, it can be difficult to picture, but um, what, what you kind of want to think about is when, when you're first forming all of this stuff, so you basically have this membrane, right? And you can think about it like, you know, a partially filled water balloon. But you wanna put some stuff inside. So you, you start dropping your intestines into the abdominal cavity, but you have to go through the membrane to do it. And so what happens is that the membrane stretches and goes with the organs. And so you have this continuous membrane that is surrounding the outside of these intestines as well as the inside of the abdomen. And so even though we talk about there being two layers, they are continuous with each other. So if you look at this diagram, it does actually demonstrate that quite well because we have these doubled over layers here. So you can see that here, this is parietal peritoneum on the inside of your abdominal muscles. And then it folds around and covers the spleen as visceral peritoneum, okay? So this is basically a very, very large thin sac that is inside the abdominal cavity. And it's so big that it's able to wrap around all of the outsides of these organs, forming the serosa, or the outermost layer of serosa. And in between the parietal and peritoneal, we have just a little bit of serous fluid. And that serous fluid allows all of this stuff to smoothly move across each other instead of potentially getting caught or stuck um, or otherwise um, causing friction. This is what it looks like if we do more of a longitudinal section. So the whole thing um, basically gets suspended from the dorsal or posterior part of the abdominal cavity. And you can see that it's got all these little hangy downy parts because these are all parts of the intestine that are sitting inside the uh, visceral peritoneum. So the part that um, connects the visceral peritoneum around the organs, 
to the parietal peritoneum up in that posterior part of the body wall is called the mesentery. So the mesentery is a double layer because remember if you're if you're sticking something you know through a bag and it surrounds it you get a layer on either side at the top right and through this double layer all of the blood vessels nerves lymphatic vessels lymph nodes all of that stuff is running to supply these organs and this also uh, functions as a fat storage because our bodies store fat everywhere so there's a couple of different parts to this mesentery um, with different names based on which parts are suspended. So the mesentery itself is what we call everything that suspends the small intestine. The large intestine is also referred to as the colon. So this is all suspended by mesocolon. Um, the appendix has its own little bit called the mesoappendix. And then the last part is your rectum and that's got a mesorectum. So it all has these different names based on um, which organs are sitting in there. Um, this is maybe not the best picture for that. That's okay. Here, let me, I have a lot of pictures. Um, so like here's mesentery here. And so you can see this is, is intestine. And then all of this is the mesentery suspending it from the abdominal wall um, and encasing it. And a lot of it is, is uh, this is a real picture over here, a lot of it is quite see-through. And really you only see the parts where the blood vessels and stuff are running. Now, not only do we have this mesentery, but we also have additional folds that don't have abdominal organs in them necessarily, but they're extra parts kind of connecting everything. They also serve as pathways for blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and nerves. They also serve as fat storage, um, and there are a lot of lymph nodes in there as well because there's a lot of immune system presence in the abdomen. So the mesentery and the mesocolon count as two of those folds, and then I'm going to touch on these guys, which don't actually have any abdominal organs suspended in them, um, but are considered like part of the digestive system because the abdominal cavity is mostly digestive system organs. And these are things that we would see on dissection as well, and we should be able to see them in lab. So this is, um, so that one was the, the mesentery here. This is mesocolon. It looks just like mesentery. The only difference is that it's suspending the large intestine instead of the small intestine. Uh, the falciform ligament is another one of the folds. So the falciform ligament actually sits between the lobes of the liver and it connects to um, the anterior portion of the abdominal wall. Uh, part of it actually is a remnant from your umbilical cord, so it, it actually connects up to um, your umbilicus, which is the fancy term for belly button. And uh, it's typically um, um, adipose storage, and then it's got some blood vessels running through it, and um, that's kind of just what it, what it is. So it kind of keeps the liver connected um, superiorly and anteriorly. Uh, the omenta are the, the larger major folds. So um, the greater omentum is the much bigger one. It's kind of like an apron, it's really weird. So it sits anteriorly to pretty much all of your abdominal organs. It kind of goes from the base of your stomach and covers all your intestines anteriorly. And then the lesser omentum sits between the stomach and the liver. So <clears throat> here's your stomach and all your intestines are underneath this. This is the greater omentum. And uh, it basically helps kind of hold all your intestines um, if for some reason any part of this was dam, uh, any of like your intestines were damaged, it would help like 
seal it off. Um, it also serves as uh, fat storage for better or worse. Sometimes it's for worse. Um, we don't have time to get into that. And then the lesser omentum is kind of between here and here. So you actually have to pick this up if you want to see the intestines underneath, which we would have seen if we did um, our cat dissections. So again, it's like not actually part of the digestive system, but it's intimately associated with most of it. And so that's why we cover it now. All right, so the last part of dealing with the anatomy here is to understand that although a lot of things are in the abdomen, not everything is in this peritoneal cavity. So not everything is sandwiched in a layer of visceral peritoneum and sitting within this parietal peritoneal sac. So other things are outside of that, but still contained within the muscles that make up the abdominal cavity. And so those things are considered to be retroperitoneal. Retro means behind, and in fact, these things tend to be posterior to the peritoneal cavity. So um, there's a variety of things that are retroperitoneal. Notably, the kidneys and the rest of the urinary system are, as well as the adrenal glands, because they sit on top of the kidneys. Um, major blood vessels, the abdominal aorta and inferior vena cava are as well. And so because they sit outside of the peritoneum, um, the anterior surface of these organs is actually covered by parietal peritoneum. And then they just kind of sit between that and the musculature of the posterior body wall. Um, other animals don't quite do this, but we have also parts of our small intestine, our pancreas, and our colon that sit retroperitoneally as well. Which to me, as somebody who learned on animals first, finds very, very weird. Um, but we're upright and they are not, and I think that's a major feature of why that happens. So here is looking at peritoneal versus retroperitoneal. So this is showing you a little bit of intestine that's within the peritoneal cavity as defined by this, suspended by mesentery. And then um, here's some ascending and descending colon sitting behind the parietal peritoneum between that and musculature. Okay, so when we say retroperitoneal, this is essentially the space that we're referring to. This is the aorta, for example, and that's the vena cava. Does that make sense? So everything that we're dealing with past the esophagus is gonna be in the abdominal cavity somewhere. All right, anybody have questions about overview anatomy before I get to this? Okay. All right, so when we look at the digestive system as a whole, um, we see that there's six basic activities necessary for the digestive system to do in order to, you know, do that whole breaking down of food and absorbing it thing. Some of them are very specific to different parts, and some of them are performed pretty much throughout the entire tract one way or another. So we'll work through these, um, touching on them as needed, and then some of them will go into more detail when we get to the specific parts. So ingestion, propulsion, um, mechanical digestion, chemical digestion, absorption, and then elimination or defecation depending on which term you want to use. Oops. So ingestion um, is a function of the mouth only. It's literally bringing food into your mouth. So starting the whole process. And we'll talk more about the mouth after we get through this overview part. Um, so this is something that the mouth gets to do all by itself, but it also is involved in both mechanical and chemical digestion um, in that we, you know, chew up the food, we mix it with saliva, um, and then the last thing we do here is in the mouth is propulsion because then we swallow it to send it on its way down the next parts of the tract. 
So when we say propulsion, we mean anything that the smooth muscle or any muscle of the digestive system is doing. Um, the, the vast majority of that is going to be smooth muscle. And one of the most common things that the gastrointestinal tract does is something called peristalsis. Any hollow organ with smooth muscle in it can pretty much do peristalsis but the gastrointestinal tract is particularly noteworthy for doing this. So the goal of peristalsis is to move things down the tract. And it does that mostly with the circular muscle. So basically you're squeezing it from behind and relaxing in front to give it somewhere to go. And you rhythmically do that and move things along the tract. Go, little gip, go, like this. So that's peristalsis. Um, and that's one of those things mediated by short reflexes. Um, the, the myenteric plexus is gonna have um, little like rhythm circuits in there that mediate that um, without needing any upper or uh, central control. Now, there are other propulsive things. We'll cover them later as they become relevant. Digestion is, of course, another major thing that the tract does, and we split that up into two parts. So mechanical or physical digestion is where we're actually breaking food into smaller pieces. Um, that includes chewing. The fancy name for that is mastication, as well as some other um, smooth muscle activities that we'll get to later. Um, it's called mechanical digestion because we're not changing the chemical makeup of the molecules. We're just breaking down the particles. So in order to change the chemical makeup, we need to use chemical digestion. And that's where we're actually having chemical reactions and breaking chemical bonds in order to make the food molecules smaller to be absorbed. So they need to be in solution. So it actually takes a lot of water to do this. Most of this is performed by enzymes, but they're aided by acids and um, certain salt compounds as well. And we'll cover those details as we get to the different relevant parts. Um, an example of uh, physical digestion is segmentation, which is another fairly common um, smooth muscle action. So segmentation can look a lot like peristalsis, but instead of propulsing something continually in one direction, it actually just um, contracts opposing parts of circular muscle and squishes stuff back and forth to mix it together. So that makes it a mechanical or physical digestion. And we'll see that especially in the intestines. So this is kind of our, our summary. We'll cover elimination defecation when we get there next week. Um, and uh, absorption we'll cover next week as well, because um, they're kind of too complicated to cover in an overview. Um, all right, any questions about that? I hope not. All right, so that takes us to the first actual part of the system, which is the mouth. So we'll do the anatomy. And this one, we don't really do the microscopic anatomy, but we'll start that when we get to the um, stomach. And we'll look at the accessory organs and um, the, the actions or functions of the mouth. So, as I said, claim to fame, only part that does the ingesting. I don't know why the mouth is so proud of that, but it is, so we have to say it. Um, and then pretty much everything else that the mouth does is thanks to its accessory organs. So teeth are accessory organs and they do the chewing or grinding part, so the physical digestion. Um, saliva from the salivary glands uh, lubricates the food and actually contains enzymes to start the chemical digestion process. And then um, the mouth is one of the organs that participates in swallowing. And we'll, we'll cover that in a couple slides. So basic mouth anatomy is surprisingly complex. We'll cover the details of this when we get to it in lab next week. 
um, but basically the mouth and oral cavity are used interchangeably. Um, the, the lips and cheeks are the outer boundaries of the mouth. Um, the tissue inside is um, mostly referred to as the gingiva. Those are the parts around the teeth. And then everything else is technically just mucous membranes. Um, obviously the tongue's in there and the palate. And then there's gonna be an opening at the back that has its own name we're not gonna worry about right now. Um, here's another view of that. So basically from the back of the tongue and the palate to the lips is the oral cavity. And then the pharynx is back here and we'll get to that next. Hold on, I got, and yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, so we'll cover relevant anatomy details um, in lab. All right, so then the saliva. Saliva um, is basically the secretions of the oral cavity, um, but it's actually formed by the contributions of many glands. So we have three major salivary glands, as in they're these like discrete um, glands that have these locations, but then we have a bunch of minor salivary glands in that pretty much all the mucous membrane inside of the mouth has teeny tiny little glands that contribute secretions. Generally speaking, we split up those secretions into um, serous or watery secretion and then mucus secretion. Saliva actually has a variety of functions. So it does cleanse the mouth um, in part just by constantly being secreted and swallowed, which helps um, minimize, um, you know, like infections and stuff. Um, it dissolves food chemicals in it so that we can taste them, right? Remember, because those need to be soluble. Um, it moistens the food and helps compact it into a bolus, which is the shape that food needs to be in in order to be swallowed. And it begins chemical digestion because it contains the enzyme amylase, which starts breaking down starch. So the three major salivary glands are the parotids, um, the submandibulars, and the sublinguals. But then, as I said, there's tons of minor ones, so pretty much all the mucous membranes. And we name them for what we call those parts. So um, we refer to the lips as labia, so the labial glands are the ones in the lips. Um, the cheeks are buccal, so buccal glands in the cheeks. Um, palatal in the palate, and there are small ones in the tongue called lingual glands, which are different from the sublingual gland, which is below the tongue. These guys actually get secreted by discrete ducts as well, and these guys are all embedded in the mucous membrane, so they don't have like giant ducts, they just kind of, you know, secrete out. Um, here you get a better view of the sublingual has a bunch of little dunks under the tongue and then the submandibular is the one that comes up to the um, top here and I'm pretty sure that's the one that can occasionally accidentally squirt out when you get excited is the wrong term when your mouth gets excited. Um, we do see increasing secretions when we know that we're going to get food, right? Your mouth waters when you're hungry or when you smell food. And that's a response to the anticipation, like, okay, we're prepared to do all these functions. So um, we usually secrete at least a liter of saliva a day. Um, but the amount varies. So in between meals, it's just a very low amount to keep your mouth moist. Um, and then we have spikes when we eat of, of higher secretions of saliva. Most of it is, of course, water. Um, but there are also other things in there. So we have ions. Um, mostly their job is to maintain an appropriate pH level. Glycoproteins are pretty much just the fancy term for what mucus is. Um, there are enzymes, notably salivary amylase. There is technically another one in there. Um, 
it's called lipase and it's supposed to start fat digestion, but we're never quite sure how far that gets or how relevant the lingual lipase is. Um, so we just kind of throw that in. Um, there are growth factors in here as well as like certain waste products. I didn't have a chance to look up the waste products and the growth factors are beyond what we want to talk about. So we're mostly just going to focus on the parts that are involved in digestion. All right, so saliva is going to be helping um, us swallow food and start chemical digestion and is of course necessary for us to taste. Teeth are going to be most useful for mechanical digestion. Of course it is possible to chew without teeth because we can gum things, but it works a lot better with teeth. So mastication is a fancy word for chewing. And as I'm sure you all know, we have two sets of teeth. So we are usually born toothless or mostly without teeth. Um, they start coming in within the first year of life. Those are our primary or deciduous teeth. They're also called baby teeth or milk teeth. Everything has too many names. Um, and then in our childhoods, we start losing those in our permanent or adult or secondary teeth come in. So we have 20 of these guys usually, and then we usually have 32 of these guys, although some of them do get taken out, so the number varies. Um, but either way, uh, they come in uh, four different types. So we have incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. So the incisors and canines are the ones in the anterior portion of the mouth, and they're mostly involved in um, ingestion. So they are helpful for biting into food and bringing it into your mouth. And then your premolars and molars are in the back along the sides. And so those guys are gonna be more involved in the mastication part or actually chewing and mechanically breaking them down. And so they're set up for that. These, these guys are gonna be thinner and sharper. And these guys have very wide surfaces um, with texture on them for chewing and grinding. Um, we can represent how many teeth we have um, with what are called dental formulas. So this is basically a quarter of your mouth when you're a baby. You have two incisors, a canine and two premolars. So that's represented like that. And then there's a right and a left side, so that's where the times two comes from. This is for your mandible or upper jaw, and then this is for your lower jaw. And then we use the same type of formula here. So again, a quarter of your mouth, two incisors, a canine, two premolars, and then three molars. Now the third molar is of course also called your wisdom tooth, and so we don't all necessarily have four wisdom teeth and even if we do there's a good chance they've been removed because we mostly don't have room in our mouths for that last tooth um, and that's because from an evolutionary standpoint our jaw size has been shrinking um, because um, having really strong chewing muscles is just not as important to us as a species anymore because we can process our food before we put it into our mouths um, whereas other species don't do that. So that's kind of the wisdom tooth thing. So this one, the third one is variable. Um, when we look at uh, overall tooth anatomy, um, we find that it is of course uh, forming a joint with the alveolar process. So that's the hole in the jawbone where the tooth sits. Um, remember that these are gom foces, so they are fibrous joints held by these periodontal ligaments. Um, the tooth itself has a crown, which is the portion above the gum line. Um, technically, it's got a neck, which is the portion between the gum line and the bone line, and then the root is the part anchored in the bone and part of the gom foces. Um, both parts have an inner hollow area called the pulp cavity. That's the um, alive part of the tooth where you have nerves and blood vessels. And that's also the part where if it's exposed, it's going to hurt very much. Um, what else? Oh, yeah. And then um, the gum is called the gingiva. 
and when it's right around the base of the tooth, it's very, um, it's much firmer and tougher than the mucous membrane in the rest of your mouth because it's, you know, it's got to hold up to the chewing by the base of the teeth. And <clears throat> the mineral portion, the outer portion of your teeth is basically the hardest substances in the body. So enamel is actually the hardest substance, but these are all made up of basically the same minerals as in our bones. So mostly um, that um, hydroxyapatite or calcium salts, but at a higher, come on. Oh boy, okay, well that's not gonna fit. Anyway, but at a higher proportion um, than in our bones so that it is a stronger uh, substance. So the enamel covers the crown with dentin underneath and then, um, oh, there's no cementum in here, but the cementum should be down here. All right, and we'll look at this again in lab two. So that's teeth, okay? Um, our last accessory organ is the tongue. So the tongue is um, mostly just a bunch of skeletal muscles. Um, it's attached to the mandible, so attached to our lower jaw. Um, it's also attached to the styloid processes of the temporal bones as well as the hyoid bone. Um, it's actually one of the important functions of the hyoid bone is to anchor the tongue. Um, it's actually fully divided into left and right halves by a medial septum. So we have this uh, um, connective tissue divider that keeps all the muscles separated. And of course it's covered in a mucous membrane. Um, and just like everything else in the mouth, because for some reason I didn't write that down anywhere, um, it's that stratified squamous epithelium, non-keratinized of course, because this is a part of the body that's exposed to a lot of abrasion and needs to be protected. So the tongue has a lot of jobs, obviously, but for the digestive system, its job is to position food for chewing, so it keeps it between our teeth, and then it also shoves it to the back of our mouth for swallowing. And as we know, um, it's got papillae on the superior surface, and that's where the majority of our taste buds are located. So here is our tongue. Um, yeah, we're not gonna worry about it too much. We'll cover more anatomy in lab if we need to, assuming I can find a less creepy picture than what we found last time. Okay, so the tongue shoves it into the back and then we're actually able to swallow. That's gonna take us to our next body part, which is the pharynx. Um, the pharynx isn't very big, so it kind of cover the throat all together. So the structures in the throat are the pharynx, the larynx, and the esophagus. <clears throat> now the larynx is the opening to the respiratory system, so it's not actually part of our pathway, but it's it's right there, and so I just want to point it out so we can see how it gets bypassed so that we don't accidentally inhale things that we're trying to swallow. Now the pharynx is just basically a short muscular funnel that connects the oral and nasal cavities to the larynx as the opening to the airways into the lungs and then to the esophagus and the rest of the gastrointestinal tract. So the esophagus is a muscular tube. Um, it's collapsed when it's not moving food. So it it's typically resting in a sort of a flat position. It's got a muscular sphincter on either end. And then the pharynx actually has three parts. So the pharynx is kind of complicated. So the pharynx is done in purple here. And there's pharynx between the nasal cavity and the opening of your airways. So your larynx is over here. And this leads to your trachea, which leads to your lungs, okay? So this is your nasopharynx behind your nasal cavity. And then this is your oropharynx behind your oral cavity. And then your laryngopharynx is the last part. And so all together, this forms this little tapered tube of skeletal muscle. And it is responsible for determining basically whether stuff is gonna go down your esophagus into your GI tract, 
or down your larynx into your trachea. This part is exclusively the um, respiratory systems and this part gets shared between the two of them. But because it's all connected, this is why when, if you swallow wrong, you can end up squirting stuff out of your nose because it can go into your mouth and then up and out the back of your nose, which I, I, I have never done before, but I imagine it's quite uncomfortable. I don't recommend it. But you know, some people enjoy doing weird things. All right, <clears throat> so we'll talk a little bit more about the pharynx in a second, but it makes more sense to kind of cover them together. So the esophagus, as I said, is just a muscular tube. Some of it is skeletal muscle and some of it is smooth muscle. Um, <clears throat> the skeletal muscle is more relevant for, for vomiting, to be honest, um, which I'm not really planning on talking about. So there's a sphincter on either side. So remember, sphincters are circular muscles that control the openings to things. So the upper esophageal sphincter is up here, controls whether things are going in for swallowing. Um, and then the lower esophageal sphincter is at the beginning of the stomach. In between, the um, esophagus uses peristalsis to move food. And as your book mentions, this is a strong enough process that even if you're upside down, you can swallow stuff and it'll actually make it into your stomach. So this is not dependent upon gravity at all. Um, this is able to function independently of gravity. All right, so this is where we take the mouth, the pharynx and the esophagus and look at them all together. So when we swallow, the fancy term for that is deglutition. I don't know why. Um, it's really complicated. So you have to coordinate over 22 muscle groups. Most of them are muscles in, in, our, in our throat that we didn't talk about at all because we, we just didn't get there. Um, and we can divide it up into two or three phases depending on which book you read, but we're gonna stick with three phases here. So <clears throat> the first phase is the voluntary phase. It's also called the buckle phase because buckle is the other word we use for mouth. And this is the part of swallowing in your mouth. So obviously we have control over this part of swallowing um, because we're using skeletal muscles, including the tongue and the cheeks. And when we push a bolus of food to the back of the oral cavity, um, that's when we're going from this voluntary phase that we're in control of to the involuntary phase that we're no longer in control of consciously and it becomes a reflexive action. So basically we're pushing the food to the back of the mouth and we're basically getting it towards the pharynx and that's gonna trigger the pharyngeal phase. And the pharyngeal phase is all about making sure that the bolus goes the right place. We need it to go into the esophagus and we don't want it to go up the narrow pharynx, up the nasopharynx, sorry, out of the nose. And we don't want it to go down into the airways. <clears throat> so we don't want it to go through the larynx either. So the soft palate, which is the, you know, the muscular back of the top of your mouth actually flaps up to block off your nasopharynx. The epiglottis is the little flap that covers your trachea when you're swallowing. So that prevents you from inhaling food. And then um, the, all those pharyngeal muscles are gonna contract and push the bolus into your um, laryngopharynx and push against the opening to the esophagus. And then reflexively, you're gonna have relaxation of this upper esophageal sphincter so that now there's a pathway for this bolus to go and it gets pushed into the esophagus, um, stretching the esophagus, which triggers the peristalsis that moves it all the way down the esophagus into your stomach. So again, voluntary phase here your tongue pushes the food bolus into the back of the oral cavity. Um, and once it hits the oropharynx, we go to reflexive action. You can see here the palate covering um, <coughs> the nasopharynx. 
here and then here. So we're constricting up here so that it can't go that way. The epiglottis is this guy. So this is the opening to your airway. So you see how it covers that and that helps guide the bolus this way. We relax the sphincter and down goes the bolus. Peristalsis, peristalsis, peristalsis. The pressure down here relaxes the lower sphincter and it gets into the stomach. All right, so that's swallowing in a nutshell. Um, this phase of it, you also get a brief moment of not breathing. You shouldn't be able to breathe during that period of time. But as I'm sure a lot of you know, if something interrupts the process, especially in between these, we can accidentally try to breathe or something. And that's when we end up you know, choking on things because a little bit of it tries to go into the airway and that triggers reflexive coughing. And then you're just coughing a bunch for a while and trying to explain that you're not choking, you can breathe just fine, but you're horribly embarrassed because you can't swallow like you think a functional human being should. As you can tell I do that a lot, especially on water. It's really embarrassing. Anyway, so um, briefly, esophagus, typical anatomy, okay? So um, the mucosa is still actually stratified squamous, epithelium, and then um, submucosa and uh, muscular layers are pretty standard, although as I mentioned, the very superior part is uh, skeletal muscle. And then this is where instead of having serosa, we have adventitia, um, because we're just kind of anchoring the esophagus in the throat and through the thorax. And because we're not in the abdomen, there's no peritoneum and therefore no serosa. All right. So we'll look at this anatomy more in lab um, under a microscope. Um, for now, we'll just look at this. You don't need to get into it more. There's nothing special about it. Um, but it, here's a picture because I found it and it's pretty. Um, you can just see how nice and thick that epithelium is. And all these little holes are um, the ducts for glands. That's a gland right there. Lots of mucus glands and stuff. All right, any questions about any of that? How are we doing on? <sighs> okay. All right, um, I guess we'll stop there and we'll pick up with stomach on Monday and we'll go through the rest of the tract and then um, we'll look at how the body deals with the absorption part um, next Wednesday when we look at the metabolism stuff, which is the sort of the additional physiological things that go with the digestive system. Um, but they're kind of dealt with separately, which is why it's two different chapters. So if you have a chance to read um, the chapters, um, please do so. And then um, the other thing is on Monday, I'll, um, I'll do the pre-lab um, for all this stuff um, after the lecture. All right. So um, please uh, email me if you have questions about lab or the lab exam. Again, it'll go live on Friday um, and it'll stay live through Saturday in case Friday is a bad day for you. Um, it'll cover everything that we have discussed, so everything on those two sheets, um, nervous system to know, special senses to know, both the gross anatomy and the histology, and hopefully I addressed any issues um, in the announcement that I sent out yesterday. Anybody have any questions about anything? Now is a good time. All right, well, if anything comes up, please shoot me an email.
I know that there's a couple of you that have emailed me that I have to get back to um, for slightly less urgent stuff, um, but I will try really hard to check it a bunch in the next couple of days um, if anything does come up kind of last minute. Otherwise, I will see you all Monday. Um, good luck on your um, lab practical. And uh, yeah, we're, we're almost there, you guys. Just a couple weeks to go before we get through this.